Yes. Yeah. All right, good. Thank you, Caleb. How's yours? Oh, there's a, it was great. I got to visit uh, Caleb's hometown. It was really fun. Woo! All the stories, memoir, and Papa Lou, all of us met him. It was great. Uh, are there, are your, anybody still taking classes right now? Nice! All right, everybody's got a little summer break action. That's great. Well, you guys have been reading me in my app. Since you have so much time on your hands, so you're already school. I'm just kidding. I think, um, you know, specifically this, for some odd reason, we talked about this on Wednesday, uh, our, our guys' group last week. Uh, for some reason, like the last couple months, I've been, you know, just blessed with just being really, really excited to get into God's Word. Um, you know, obviously, like 90% of my life, like I'm sure I can speak for everyone, um, that uh, we just, we have a very hard time having consistent time in the Word. And like one thing that's just been such a, a just a blessing for me is, is going back to the Old Testament. I've just I've been thoroughly just enjoying reading you know Nehemiah. Um, it's just it's just such a great story. And I think what's unique about the Old Testament is that you have this this narrative story that is actually very engaging because it has plots and it has uh, characters and character development and ups and downs and there's this overarching story and like for, for me it's just been it's actually been engaging where like for for a season of my life that's that's very unique i've been i've been almost like like just page turning like, like a novel it's just been it's been really exciting you know usually like every time at lunch you know i usually have a time where i can i can open it up and just read through you know first and second samuel is what i've been going through i just finished that and then we'll go through first and second kings and chronicles and then we'll be right here ezra nehemiah and esther is what you know this all kind of one time i'll be caught up you know ready to go through that and it's just it's, you know it's just really it's just really refreshing and i think you know the biggest thing that i was taking away as i was preparing for this this you know this message today was just that um, the Old Testament is just this big, long narrative story, and it, it really is exciting. It can be engaging, you know, if we if we allow ourselves to just get in the Word and read it. Um, so specifically, we're going through Nehemiah. We're going to pick up where uh, Caleb left off uh, two weeks ago. Um, so I'll read it. Uh, for, well, before I read, I'll give us if there if you guys have missed a couple services, I'll just give us a brief, just very small summary. Okay. Um, one like so. Israel is God's chosen people, right? All throughout the Old Testament, Israel is God's chosen people. And, up, and through the Old Testament, we have ups and downs. Um, and uh, you know, God is continually faithful. His people are not. And there's one time that you know, God's basically like, all right, I'm going to let my people get conquered. They're Jerusalem. Their, the, the, the prize city that they, that they love is going to be completely overtaken and destroyed. Um, and the, those, that was by Babylon. Okay, uh, and like again, like it's, it's, what's, what's fun about going through the Old Testament is you see this whole this whole story. Like going back to First Samuel actually starts, you know, this whole process. But Babylon comes comes in and completely just wipes out the entire city of Israel. And Babylon's actually unique in the sense that they had this like kind of sick but genius. Uh, strategy where they would come in, they would obviously like kill a lot of people because it was war and they were overtaking their conquering. But what they did is they actually took the, the young, um, the young people that showed intelligence and promise and future kind of potential. They actually took those people and dragged them back to Babylon and tried to main, brainwash them into Babylonian culture. It's, it's actually, I mean, it's kind of genius. Their idea is like, well, if you want to destroy a, a, a culture, an entire nation of people, you take. You know, you, you, you take their leaders and you brainwash them to kind of assimilate them into Babylon and eventually you're just going to cut off the generations, you know, over years and years because people will not know where they came from. You know, like the, the, the most the most important people are kind of being, they, you know, the, the, I, the goal was that they, they're dragged off to Babylon and they just, they just start thinking, you know what, Babylon's a great place. And then slowly but surely the Israelite heritage stops. So that's what, that's what happened, okay? And it's a, it's a huge, huge part in the story of the Old Testament is this Babylonian, you know, conquering. But then, like, you know, like all of history, uh, Persia comes and they wipe out Babylon. And so now Persia is reigning over all the areas that Babylon used to have. And here we have Nehemiah. Nehemiah is um, just obviously, you know, through God's sovereignty, um, he is just, he has a really significant place in the, the Persian, you know, kingdom. He's the cupbearer of the king, like we've already talked about, right? And then, you know, like we've, we've talked about just this last, you know, the last service was, they, you know, the king and Nehemiah had this conversation where Nehemiah's like, can I please go back to uh, my hometown and rebuild it? 
And it is a complete miracle of God that that is allowed. Now, because there's just a lot of implications, it's just a huge amount of grace that that king had, and just an ability, which, which fun fact, and this is another thing that just blew me away, it's like, if you remember the, the story of Esther, like, it's, it's, it's behind this, the story in, in the Bible, but there's absolutely a great reason to believe that Esther was actually before this, this time that, uh, that Nehemiah came before the king, it's like, hey, can I go to, to Jerusalem? So if you guys are familiar with the story of Esther, this queen that kind of worked her way, you know, through like a beauty pageant into the kingdom, and she was she was, she was um, taken as a queen, and she she ends up saving the Jews, you know, in this in this crazy story, and, and there's very good reason to believe that that happened either just before or a little time before Nehemiah is now coming before the king. It's like, hey, my Jewish brothers are really hurting in Israel, in Israel. and like there's very good chance that in the king's mind he's like Esther. Esther, yeah, I know about you guys. Okay, well, I will give you grace and I'll allow you to go. And it's like, it's just incredible to see the, the complexity of, of the story that God weaves together. And so we're going to pick up on that story. So with that background, we hopefully we'll all you know, cut, up, cut up with at least most of the significant details. We're going to pick up in Nehemiah chapter 2 and read through 11 through 17. So, um, so I went to Jerusalem. The eye is Nehemiah. Um, so I went to Jerusalem and was there three days. And then I rose in the night, I and a few men with me, and I told no one what my God had put into my heart to do for Jerusalem. And there was no animal with me but the one in which I rode. I went out by night by the valley gate to the dragon spring to the dumb gate, and I expected the walls of Jerusalem that were broken down and its gates that had been destroyed by fire. Then I went on to the fountain gate to the king's pool. And there was no room for the animal that was under me to pass. Then I went up to the night by the valley, inspected the wall, and turned back and entered the valley gate, and so returned. And the officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing, and I had not yet told the Jews, the priests, and nobles, the officials, the rest who were actually going to do the work. Then I said to them, You see the trouble we are in, how Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burned. Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem, that we may no longer suffer derision. So we're going to stop there. Um, as I'm going through this passage and I'm trying to read over it and I'm trying to figure out, you know, what, what is something that I feel like you know, really, you know, God wants to communicate, the one, the one question that came back to me was, why walls? Like, Nehemiah, why walls? Out of, out of all things, like, why is that your biggest priority? And Nehemiah gets this stamp of this seal of approval from one, like, one of the most important people in the entire world at the time, and he's like, I'm going to go build walls around the city. Now, today, walls have like a, a pretty bad connotation. You know, in year 2016, we're all about breaking down walls, right? We're all like, you know, taking, breaking down walls between race and even gender and class status. Um, you know, when you're trying to like really get to know someone, usually if they're kind of tough and they're hard to get in, you, you say they have kind of, they put walls up, right? And you encourage them, like, oh, just, you know, lay your defenses down, like, like let someone into your life, let, you know, uh, if they have you know, some type of baggage, they have those walls up. You know, usually we, we're trying to break those down in a good way. You know, New Life OSU, we're all about um, not, not having this us versus them mentality that we, you know, we sometimes we preach about and we talk about and we try to get into our culture. Of just like we don't want to have a wall of you know or like a Christian bubble, which is us and we're protecting ourselves from the outside world. Like the gospel is the exact opposite. You know, with all these things in mind, it's like why Nehemiah are you so obsessed and so fixated on building this wall? Like what about like why not teach them some self-defense classes? You know, like you could you could not worry about the wall. You know, if everybody can like you know defend themselves if they come, if if enemies did come. You know, why not have, why not start some farms, right? I mean, like, you have this big wave of people coming back. They're going to have to eat food, shelter, clothing, right? Those are, those are, you know, the three kind of the, you know, survival needs of the, of the human race. Like, he doesn't, he doesn't go that way first. I think us, you know, too, I think, you know, with our, our lens, we'd be like, what about community, my name, my app? Like, you have a broken people. Is shouldn't your priority be to walk in and try to gather the people, unite them, you know, and try to, uh, you know, have a Bible study once a week, you know, something like that, where you kind of talk about the Bible, you know, and he, he did do that. Nehemiah had a huge passion for the Word of God, but it did, I mean, it, was, it came after building the wall. He sat down, everybody, we'll, we'll talk about that later in the summer, but 
Um, the heat, I mean, walls. Why? Why walls? So that's what we're going to talk about. Even if you haven't asked yourself that question, that's the question I ask myself, so that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, but uh, there, I think there are some things that we can learn you know, from this. Uh, I'm going to pray, and uh, we'll get started. Um, Heavenly Father, uh, God, we just we thank you for your story. We thank you for your, your faithfulness and your grace. Um, we thank you for this Bible um, and just how valuable and how helpful it is in our life. God, we ask that you would just enlighten us um, and teach us today. And uh, we just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, so, in your bulletins, um, actually, I actually forgot to grab one. Shoot. Uh, but there, there we're basically going to be talking about three things that, that I can see um, of why the walls were priority number one for, for Nehemiah. Um, and, it, you know, again, to, before we start, uh, I do want to say two things, two, like, foundational things, just, you know, before we get started, um, caveats. One, I, I understand, like, technically this is not priority number one. So if we look at, if we look about this in context, the temple was actually priority number one. Um, Ezra is the book before Nehemiah, and Ezra went to, um, went to back to Jerusalem just a little bit before Nehemiah did. We know that Ezra and Nehemiah are contemporaries, so they lived together, and, um, like, like, lived at the same time. Um, and... And Ezra, when he went back, his priority uh, number one was building the temple. So that, that's actually technically when God's you know, bringing his, his plan, bringing these people back, temple was priority number one. But Nehemiah's priority was his number one, aka priority number two, is the walls. So I do want to get that you know, out there just to make sure we're being, you know, being true to the text. Um, so, and the other, other caveat um, is, I forgot. All right, so um, the, the, we just, I, I think the biggest thing we have to do is, is, is take, a, take a step back um, and see this in the large like, history of what's actually going on. Okay, so the things that we're going to go through um, you know, are, not, are not actually found in Nehemiah um, the, in, in the passage we just read. Uh, I was kind of giving the, uh, the, guys, the staff guys a hard time because I miss one staff meeting. Okay, so I missed one staff meeting, and they assigned me the chapter three, which is just a big long list of names and what area of the wall they built. It's like here, you guys, here, Chris, you can talk about this one. <laughs> chapter like if you read chapter three, it's just a big long list of like, hey, has built this wall. You know, Alia, you know, well, built this section of the wall, and for like 26 verses. <laughs> so I think, I mean, and then there's absolutely there's absolutely great things to see in that. I think that when we talk about why this question of why he built the walls first. We, all these points are going to be taking a step back at the larger story of what God is doing, a larger story of what's happening. Um, so these walls, your point number one are, is uh, these walls have history. These walls have history. These are not just walls. They are part of a huge background of identity and history and God's faithfulness and God's promise. Um, the Jerusalem, um, is, there's, there's good reason to believe this specific place goes back all the way to Genesis by this guy named Melchizedek that you don't hear very often. There's this king, Melchizedek was a, a king um, in this land called Salem. So if you picture Salem, they put a little Jeru right in front of it. It's Jerusalem. And there's like, there is a good reason to believe that this is the exact same area that he reigned in. Like, like I mean, this is like thousands of years beforehand. And then we see um, the, the glory days of Israel. If we're going to put ourselves in the shoes of an Israelite, what they look back to is, is the days of David. And Jerusalem goes like the, the, you know, when Jerusalem, the beginning of it, you know, as far as we know it, is, is, when, is when David was king and he was conquering and David was just kicking butt and taking names all over the place. Like David is like George Washington to us, you know, Abraham, Abraham Lincoln to us. Abraham is, or, um, David is like that to, um, to the Israelites. And so, cause, so David's going through and he conquers his territory that was held by these, these Jebusites is what they were named. Um, and then they're like, David, what do you want to call it? And he's like, David's city. We're like, all right, great, all right, we'll call it the city of David. And then later it's called the city of God, it's called Zion, it's you know, in Jerusalem. It's, it's all the same place. And the entirety of the Israelite history and identity is wrapped up in this, in this city. It's a huge part 
of just of who they are. So th this is, these are not just merely walls. Um, it's, it's a part of, uh, of the pride. Let's look at the Nehemiah chapter 1 really quick that we've already talked about. Uh, verses 3, uh, verse, verse, chapter 1, verse 3. Um, and they said to me, so this is uh, some type of news bringer to, to Nehemiah. Um, he said to him, uh, the remnant there in the, in the providence who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are destroyed by fire. A specific word there that's said multiple times in Nehemiah is this word shame. This, this word of like disdain. It's just like, this is embarrassing. Like this is our city um, and it, it is just in shambles. You know, so Nehemiah, like the next verse in chapter 4, which I don't think you guys have, but um, he just sits down and he weeps and it says he mourned for days. So the reason, I mean, this is, this is such a, a big deal uh, because it's also like it was just a sign of God's blessing. Like, you know, we, we see in multiple areas, like, you know, God promised this land to them and God is, you know, it has been along with Israel to, you know, to this, to this whole, you know, history. And to see broken walls is to see God's, you know, hand turning away. God turning away and his, turning his back on his people. And it's just, it's, just, it's, it's embarrassing. It's everyone in that world is looking at the Israelites and saying, what type of God do you have? Your, your city is burning, your, your, your people are scattered, your, uh, you know, your temple has been defiled. Like, it, it's just, it's, it's huge. Like, this is, this is a big deal, it's a big place. And it specifically marks the, the blessing of, of God. Um, so, so, what is Nehemiah's response? You know, we've talked about this a little bit already in a couple of services. Um, Nehemiah's response is he just, he's immediately just completely broken. He's completely broken. He mourns and cries for days, he says. He's so sad that the king sees it and asks him about it. I mean, I don't know a lot about kings that, you know, in those times, but I imagine the king doesn't wake up and think, like, oh, I wonder how Nehemiah's doing today. You know, I wonder how my cupbearer is feeling. Like, that's not, that's not really on his radar, but he was so visibly upset that they actually, you know, the king you know, noticed it and he calls him out on it. Like, so this is, this is I want to I do a pause and kind of flip this, you know, on us right now. You know, that we can, we can start, to, you know, we can enter, enter into the story and really start to apply it, you know, to ourselves. You know, and I think these questions are in your bulletin is, you know, do you treasure the moments that, where God has moved in your life? Like, do you treasure the moments where God has moved in your life, like me and my ass? Like, this Jerusalem is such a huge part of his history. Like, what about your history? Like, what about, like, some summer where God really moves in your heart? You know, just, just take some time right now and just kind of try to think about those times. Think about, you know, just a big moment. Maybe, maybe when God intersected your life for the first time, where you just had this, this great experience, or you saw, him, you saw him move in such a, a faithful way. Like, do you treasure those moments? Or are they going to slowly fall off, you know, the back of your memory as time goes by? It's, it's, I think it's incredibly important, you know, again, if we tie it back to the, what, the, what the Babylonian purpose was of bringing Nehemiah and Daniel and all these people into their, um, into their kingdom, was to brainwash them and to have them forget who they were, have them forget who their identity was. And Nehemiah was strong-minded and, and loved the Lord, and he never forgot what Jerusalem meant, he never forgot what those walls meant, what that temple meant. I'm like so, like, do we do we have that in our lives? Like, do you do you stop and do you reflect and do you treasure those moments and, and keep little keepsakes or uh, you know like something like you know journals or something like that where you can think back and look and truly truly treasure like man God God moved in this way. You know, I, I was actually preparing for this uh, today and I can look up in my bookshelf and I can see at the top is this basket of. Uh, stuff that uh, was from our proposal, like the day I proposed to Tara. My like, Tara put it all in his basket. You can go out, we can pull it down, and we can look at all the letters. You know, I had this like little scavenger hunt thing, and she has everything in there. But we can go back and kind of reflect that. It's right up there. And right next to it, I have my box of all the letters that Tara's you know written me you know, over the years because she knows I'm a words of affirmation you know person. So I just keep those. Um, and and uh, like when I, um, a lot of you guys probably already know, but like I feel like there's there there's a one pivotal moment where I feel like God said to Tara and I, like, you guys are going to Mexico someday. Get ready. 
You know, I know there's a lot of details that have to fall into place with that, but like the first thing I wanted to do is I wanted to get a picture. So I had Morgan, um, you know, kind of, you know, Photoshop this this photo of, of uh, Mexico, of a trip that we took there, um, and and have it put on a canvas. And now that canvas is is, is, is on my wall. So I, ideally, I, it doesn't really happen, but ideally, I walk I walk by, I see it, I'm like, yes, God, you, you said that. You said that because it's very easy six months to 12 months down the road to, to start to question like yeah did, did i really did really i really say that you know so like so my whole point of this is like do do we treasure those moments like do you treasure those moments that god has intervened in your life and do you hold on to them where everything can be ripped away and years down the road you can be in a really dark place and you can know that god is good because of those things so that that's kind of the first the first ground you know Foundation, foundational thing of why I think Nehemiah was so bent on getting these walls up first. The strong walls that are visible to all the people around the world are, are is, a, is a strong proclamation that God is with the people of Israel. And he knows that. He wants to get them up. Um, second thing is more of a, um, a, a straightforward, like, well, how we view the importance of walls. Like, it's just more, it, it's common sense, is that um, vulnerable things need to be protected. Vulnerable things need protected. So again, we have to kind of take a step back and look at what's happening um, in history. Ezra is the book right before this, and Ezra is is rebuilding the temple. That was the first thing that happened in this whole you know chain of events that got Israel back to Israel, uh, Israelites back to Israel. So right now we either have a temple that's we don't know exactly when Nehemiah came in, or at least I don't know when he came in. Uh, so either the temple is, is currently like almost being built or being built, or it's done. It's a brand new temple, completely vulnerable, completely vulnerable. Any any uh, you know country or enemy can walk straight into Jerusalem and just tear everything down again. And the temple, you know, if, if you, you know, just as a reminder, the temple was a big deal because that's where God dwelt. You know, it's different from what we have today. Today, um, if you if you have faith in Christ Jesus and you put your faith in Him, the Holy Spirit comes in, and we are told that we are actually a temple. That the Holy Spirit dwells in us. We are that temple. It's different back then. Israelites had this physical building of a temple that God was said to dwell, and, and right now it's very vulnerable. Like there's nothing around to protect it. But not only is the temple vulnerable, but the people of Israel is is vulnerable. So they are scattered. They are broken. Um, they are ashamed. You know, they're they're young. Maybe they're for, you know a lot of. I mean, if you think about it, their upper generation was completely taken out by Babylon. So they you know they're they're probably young. They don't maybe even have you know a good history, a good education about you know what Israel is. They're just they're they're very fractured, um, and they need to be protected. And that the reason why I think this is so important to us um, is. I'll give, you, I'll give another analogy. Like, I, if, you, if you guys that um, know, I'm taking this test to become a, a financial, like, to become a CFP. I'm going to take it in July, and I've been, I'm spending a lot of time working on it. I'm excited about it. I, I really do enjoy it. Um, so basically, it's, it's in financial planning. Is it, it's, you're supposed to be able to sit down with someone and do a comprehensive financial plan where you're covering, you know, their their mortgage, their their car insurance, their retirement plans, their investments, their kids' you know tuition, you know, costs and savings for that. And do you guys know what the foundation of a financial plan is? The foundation of a financial plan is actually insurance. The foundation of a financial plan is insurance. Because here's the idea. You could be a magnificent you know, advisor, and you could get people to really make a lot of money um, and really have a lot of you know, you know, earthly security, at least. Um, and they could have all their ducks in a row. But let's say you don't have adequate car insurance, and that person gets in an accident that is their fault, and they're liable. Suddenly, they are open now to liability claims and a lawsuit that can completely undermine everything that you've done in all the other areas of their, of their life. They could have this, this big nest egg, and they could be on, their, on the way to Florida, you know, or, uh, ready to retire, and if they don't have that, everything could be undone. You know, maybe a little more close to home is like, you know, what if, what if just an average middle, middle class family, the father is the only one working, the mother wants to stay home and take care of the kids, um, and everything's fine. Like they, they, are, they are okay and they are doing well. Um, but what if the, the father gets disabled? 
somehow he gets injured and he, and he can't really work the same way he did. And that, 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 you know, that change can completely, just in a moment, can completely undermine everything else that you did. And so financial advisors are so adamant about getting, because insurance is also pretty cheap. Well, let's, let's say, actually, for example, let's say, you know, you're doing well, you're maybe newly married, you know, and your next door neighbor's apartment catches on fire. <laughs> and, just, and everything you have is just covered in smoke, basically useless, you know, like, like for example, just hypothetically speaking. You know? <laughs> Um, it's, it's just, you know, the financial advisors are so adamant about getting just proper insurance as a foundation because it, it, it protects you. You know, and I understand a lot of that is just kind of American comfort and like I'm not, I'm not you know, necessarily, you know, a proponent of uh, putting your, putting all your security and financial, you know, and, and earthly things. But, that, but it's, it's the idea that I'm trying to pull out is that it, it's the same thing that I'm seeing with sin. It's the same thing that I can see and hear about the wall. Because they're very real the wall and they're talking about all these gates. And like if you think about it, it only takes one weak gate to have the enemy coming come streaming in and they are now inside your city and you are done from the inside out. Like you could build these magnificent walls around your temple or around your people and you could be so safe if you have one or two gates that were poorly made or they were, they were weak and the enemy goes to it, you know, it, it, it's, it doesn't matter what the rest of your strongholds are. You know, just ask Darth Vader, you know? All they had to do, I, I think I've brought this up multiple times, but like, it just kills me, like, all they need to do is get one little blaster in one little, like, tiny place, and everything's done. Like, still, like that star gone. It's like, there's always just a convenient, like, weakness in those Star Wars, you know, just magnificent buildings and, and planets that they build. But if you get, a, you get a blaster, like, right in the spot, you know, same thing like with Lord of the Rings. It's like if you just get that little ring to the specific mountain and throw it in that specific lava, everything, you know, everything's fine. Everything's gone. You know, but it's the same thing in our spiritual lives. It's the same thing in our spiritual lives. It just takes one way in for, for Satan and our enemy that we have to just get his foothold in. And it doesn't matter how well in life we have uh, things taken care of. That he can really do damage and just tear it apart from the inside. It just takes it just takes one thing. Um, so that I mean that's that's something I, that's what I really wanted to, to to see and focus on a little bit for you know for this afternoon. Um, just think about the vulnerable areas in your life right now. Just think about your weaknesses and the vulnerable areas that you have in your life. And again, I, I do want this is probably not needed to be said, but I, it's important enough to say, like, I'm not talking about salvation. I'm not saying that something, a, a certain sin can creep in and you're going to lose your salvation. You know, I can think I can speak on behalf of new life that we don't believe like that that can happen. I, I, just, I just mean, like, your, your, your life, your, your, your joy. You know, you can, Satan can get a hold of one area of your life. He can sneak in, set up camp, and completely do you in from the inside out. And just, it just have devastating consequences on your ministry, on your marriage, on your joy, you know, and I just, a lot of, a lot of things. I, I know I'm sure that all of you are coming to mind of, of, as I'm talking, of just the weaknesses that you have. You know, I think right now, personally, I just think that um, today, you know, Satan attacks, you know, uh, our, our, our marriages, uh, sexuality, and relationships. Like that, that, that's the one I, I think I could say on behalf of all of us in this room that that is a weakness that we all have, is those three things. You know, but, but there's, there's other things. There's, you know, there, there's pride, there's, there's greed, there's uh, selfishness. Uh, there, there's, there's so many things that it, it, it's a weak part in, you know, because what, what I'm doing is as I'm comparing this Jerusalem wall to we are the temple. If, if you know Jesus Christ, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And you have this, this wall, this fortress that is around you. And if you have weaknesses in your wall, and if it's vulnerable, then it's, 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 that is where you're going to be attacked. And what, the, next, the next step is going to be kind of going, going into that about why that really is a problem. Uh, but just, just take some time and you know, just think about that really quick. About what, what are some vulnerable areas that you have in your life? You know, I'll get, I'll get you know, vulnerable with you guys. I was, I was planning on saying this for a while, but, you know, um, like for me, I don't think, 
I can I don't I don't see myself ever having a legitimate excuse to ever having unfiltered, unrestricted, completely unmonitored internet access for the rest of my life. I, I, I don't I can't if I had an argument with myself, I can't see any type of you know, Chris Doppelganger convincing me that it's ever okay or really beneficial or wise to ever lift off, you know, completely, completely unrestricted, unfiltered, you know, internet access. You know, because, because pornography has been such a huge part of my past, you know, and, and praise God, it's, it's been good for a year or two, you know, but right now I have this, this application that where anything even remotely suspicious you know, Tara gets an email once a week and says, you know, no questionable sites were visited. Or if, if there are, then it lists them out. And she, she can go to it and see if it was, you know, if it was a problem or not. And like, that, that's just an example to me of like um, a, a, a weakness area that I, I want to, to, to barricade and strengthen and, 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 and run to to support. Because I know that if it's, if it's not there, it's just foolishness for me. And that, I'm gonna, I should carry that for the rest of my life. You know, like my phone, the, the app doesn't work for the phone, so I have to go in and take, I have to take Safari and YouTube completely off my phone. I have to use this really frustrating app that was made, you know, by this nonprofit organization that's supposed to replace Safari. So if you think about all these, like, you know, fun bells and whistles that the Apple iPhone has, and I, I'm using, like, this crappy version of Safari, you know, from this. You know, that I can't like copy and paste URLs, it doesn't automatically go. You know, I have all these inconveniences. I'm like, man, like, is it ever, is, is our, is Tyr and I's marriage ever not important enough to, 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 let, to let that weakness be unguarded? So the, the, the reason that, you know, I'm, I'm going to flow this into the next point. Um, because the next point is why these weaknesses are so important. The um, next point is uh, the, the reason why the walls were important is because it gave the remnant in Israel personal responsibility over their own protection. It gave Israel personal responsibility over their own protection. Okay, it's, it's one thing to understand that you have vulnerabilities and you have weaknesses no matter what it is in your life. No matter what it is. It's good to be aware of them. It's good to understand them. But here in, in this passage, we actually can see a pretty deep theological point that um, we is actually, we, we, me, we have some personal responsibility in protecting ourselves from those things. It's, it's not just as simple as, as throwing up a prayer saying, God, please, you know, please stop me from this temptation. Please, you know, stop myself. It's just not my pride. Like, that is, that is very good. That's going to be our final point. It's going to be an application. You know, that is, that is true. But biblically speaking, God looks at his people and says, you have to have some personal responsibility in this. Like, you have to at least make an attempt to guard your weaknesses, to, to go to the gates, to rebuild the walls. You know, these are the, this is the way, this is the, the version of a wall that, that is a good biblical thing. So, so it gives remnant Israel personal responsibility for their own protection. So what we see in chapter 3, which if you want to read it for fun, you can. Uh, there, are, there are definitely some cool things to pull out of chapter 3. You know, if you really study what you know, the different gates are, the, who the different people are they list. But the one thing that I'll pull out is that Nehemiah is assigning all people to help rebuild the wall. Everyone is involved in this process. You know, and a lot of people go to Nehemiah and they, and they, they look through this book, you know, praising him for his leadership ability, which, which is true. Um, one great thing that he does is he looks some people in the eye and he says, okay, you, you're going to repair the wall that's directly in front of your house. Like, that's pretty smart, right? Like, I mean, if you're, gonna, if you're trying to motivate people, you know, put, the father, put the, the father in charge of the wall that's directly in front of his children and his wife and his goats, you know? Like, that's, that, that's going to motivate I mean, He's probably going to build the wall and, and protect them in, in a pretty good way, right? Like, maybe better than if he was on the other side of Jerusalem, for, you know, in an unrelated area. But so, like, so Nehemiah, he's got some great, like, leadership principles that we can pull from. But specifically, he is looking at the people of Israel, Israel, and he's saying, you have personal responsibility in this battle. Like, you guys have to be the ones to build the wall. 
we got to do this fast. we got to do this quickly. We can't hire in builders and take, you know, six months to get this done. Like, we need you. These are your walls. These are your things that you're protecting. This is our temple that we're trying to protect. It, it falls on us. It falls on our heads. Um, it's, it's chapter uh, 3, verse 10. If you want to look at, you know, when he looks at the person and, say, and says, um, you know, you build the build section of the wall that's in front of your home. Um, the other thing that I thought was interesting, and I'm not going to talk about this too long because I don't want to steal the thunder of whoever's after me, but if we look you know, quickly into chapter 4, um, 4.16, actually, I want, I want to actually stop and read this. Um, so chapter 4, verses 16. Um, some small amount of, of context. Um, there are some, these, these three you know, dudes that are just trying everything they can to, to, to spoil and ruin uh, Nehemiah's attempts. Uh, there's these three outsiders that are Samaritans, and they're, 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 they're just trying to stop the effort of the wall being rebuilt because they have a lot of motivation to do so. And they just did some threats. I think before, right before this, they, they threatened to stop, like they were going to come and attack or something like that. So we pick that up in four, uh, 416, and Nehemiah says, From that day on, half of my servants worked on construction and half led the spears, held the spears, shields, bows, and coats of mail. And the leaders stood behind the whole house of Judah, who were building the wall. And to me, this this is this is very impressive to me, because like I, I think a good healthy question is Nehemiah, do you do you believe that God's going to protect you? Like, do you do you believe that God's given you this this uh, this charge to build this wall? It's like why are you taking fifty percent of your own workers? and just putting them in defensive armors with spears, and they are doing nothing except standing there and just looking out for a potential, uh, for a potential enemy, a potential attack, which, which doesn't come. You know, and that, that, could be, that could be a fairly like, critical question. And like, I, I really appreciate like, Tim, Tim Keller is where I got you know, this kind of insight from. I, thought, I think it's, this is so true. It's like this is a perf- perfect picture of um, the next blank I think you have to fill in is uh, God's sovereignty versus our own personal, mankind's uh, personal responsibility, or mankind's responsibility. And it's just, it's just very, very compelling to me, you know, this idea that, uh, you know, out, out of the same sentence, like you can read through chapter four, Nehemiah is saying, our God is going to fight for us. And then the next sentence he's saying, all right, now have you guys go stand guard. It's like, I mean, does it seem like there's a little bit of tension there? Like, is I me, mean, Nehemiah, do you think God's going to protect you? Like, yes, I do. Do you think it's, it's some of your job to do some of the protecting? Yes, he does. You know, like, you see what I mean? Like, there are, there are two agents at work. There is the faithful God that is going to be with you as you are fighting this battle. Uh, all of your vulnerabilities, all your weaknesses that you've already been thinking about. You, you, there's an absolute faith that God is going to help you through that. And then there's also at the same exact time an absolute responsibility on your shoulders to do something defending. To, to get in there, to try, you know, to, to put on the armor. You know, like Ephesians, he talks about the armor of God. You're like, that, that stuff is not just stuff we blow by. It's, 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 a, it's a personal responsibility. You know, knowing that our effort and our ability to be successful or not is not, is, you know, that doesn't, that doesn't uh, change the end outcome. God is sovereign, and God is good, and God can do anything he wants. Um, so his, his will is going to rain, it's going to you know, rain out anymore, either way. But biblically, I, I think we have to look at ourselves and say, I, I have a responsibility to get in and join this fight that my God is going to win already. So you know, does that make sense? Um, so you know, we, we identify our weaknesses, but then we also... We, we look and we, we see how we can also join the effort to protect ourselves. It is ours, also our responsibility to get involved and protect ourselves. Um, I, think, I think sometimes the, the danger can be you start to, you know, like maybe you get together, you know, once a week and you, and you start asking God, you know, God, please help me with this issue. Please help me with this issue. And you're just, you're only just throwing up prayers but you're, you're not doing anything yourself, you know, to, to, to stop those things from happening. You know, like, you, like, you're, like you're still putting yourself in the situations that are going to lead down that road 
or you're, you're not having you know, some form of you know, accountability uh, that is going to stop and kind of call you out on that. Or you know, just, just whatever your vulnerability, whatever your weakness is, you know, I, I, I think, I, I think I, you know, we're on the same page as far as what we're talking about, but um, it's, we, have, we have some great responsibility in that. So with that said, the, the uplifting note that I want to end on uh, this afternoon um, if, if everybody has a Bible, I actually would love for you to personally turn to this in your own Bible. Um, we're going to go through Psalm 91. And we're also going to have it on the screen now. So um, I'm going to give you the points about this passage first. And then I'm actually just going to, um, you know, Christy's going to come up and just, you know, play just a little bit. Uh, and I just want you to read over Psalm 91 yourself. Just quietly and reflect. Because this, after everything that we've said, after everything that we can learn from Nehemiah, this is what we can go home to. This is what we can put in the bank. This, you know, this is what we have to remember this truth. Okay, so in your bulletins, you know, it's, we have to dwell in God daily. We have to dwell in God daily. What we see in Psalm 91 is this beautiful picture, this, this praise that God is our fortress, that he is our refuge. And when you, when you read that, I want you to think of this Jerusalem and this, this temple that God dwells in. And I want us to remember like, okay, I am the temple of God. That is my identity. The Holy Spirit dwells in me. The very same power that raised Christ from the dead is in me today. Like that, that is who I am. And that is a beautiful, strong, powerful thing. And then we can remember that God is our fortress. So there we see Jerusalem, right there. We see, we see the, the temple, and then we see our holy God that is creating the protective per, uh, perimeter around us. But then, then the personal then the personal responsibility thing you know, kicks in is we have to dwell in God. God is the fortress. You know, in this passage, I, mean, I, think it's, I think we can argue that it's possible, at least for a time being, to run outside of the walls. And you're, you're just completely unprotected. It's like you have to dwell in God. And He, and then in turn, is your fortress. So that means we have, like, I, I just firmly believe that if you're, in these weaknesses and vulnerabilities we have, if you are, if you are dwelling in God, God is going to do, is going to protect you from those. Because either you're going to be reading and it's going to encourage you, or you're going to be reading or it's going to actually convict you. And that's a beautiful thing. You know, you're, you're going to be reading something and, and God's going to say, oh, you see this right here? You know, this is a weakness. You know, you have to work on this. And you're like, great. Thank you. It's good to hear a word from the Lord. Uh, or at the very last word, maybe he'll just encourage you. Or maybe he'll alert you to other, to like, you know, wolves and sheep's clothing. Like when we dwell in God and we, when we are surrounded and filled with his presence, that is when we are the most alert, the most protected, the most, the safest that we can possibly be from those, you know, from those vulnerabilities and weaknesses. I love like the, the, the specific verses that, you know, Christy read. It's just, you know, God's saying, you know, I, they, they cling to me, is the word. Like, they cling to me, so therefore, I protect them. I am their fortress. So, it, just in closing, closing, it's just, it's, you know, protect your guys' story, protect your history, protect your monument, monuments and the memorials that you have that God has done for you. Protect those, hold those close, keep them in your heart, keep them, you know, emotionally, uh, there, uh, but then guard your vulnerable spots and take responsibility, knowing that you can run to the Lord and dwell in Him, and and it's, it's taken care of at that point. He's my fortress. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to pray, um, and so Christy will play. You know, come up and just um, provide just a little bit of music. But uh, as soon as we're done praying, I just want you to just read through Psalm 91. Um, it is going to be up here, um, so it'll probably be a couple slides, so you have to you know, just go along with it. Um, but, uh, yeah, so just you know, go ahead, I'm going to pray for us, and then uh, we'll, we'll close out. Uh, Heavenly Father, uh, Lord, we love you. Um, God, I just, I just thank you for your story. Um, I see it's fun, God, to just get 
into the nitty gritty details um, of just what you did for Israel, how it applies to us, how it's how we are just a further fulfillment of that. Kind of things that we can learn, the things we can admire about the people who have come before us and the ways that you have just been faithful. And God, we, we ask you to, to search our hearts you know, search our thoughts and see if there's any offensive uh, thing that is in us and lead us just to, to things that are everlasting, things that are eternal, things that are of you. God, we know that we are a temple. We thank you. We thank you for that truth. We thank you for what that means. It means that you, the un, unlimited, un, like the, the powerful unlimited power, uh, unlimited love, God, that is all just dwelling inside of us. God, and it gives us a new identity. And then it also, you are also our fortress, God. That you physically put the walls around us that protect us from, from attachments from our very real enemy. So God, I, I do ask that you would help us just take a, take a journey and and really uh, reflect on the weaknesses and the vulnerabilities that we have, just our predisposition to sin, Father, that that's in our very nature. God, however it might manifest itself, Lord, we ask that you would open our eyes to that, and that you would give us some instructions, you would give us our, our, <laughs> our duties, if you will, God, of, of keeping up the walls. Of, of building, you know, the, the walls that are in front of us that, that protect us and protect our temple. Um, knowing full well that we, we don't have to earn anything, we don't have to, to even protect well, <laughs> honestly, like, it, it's, it's not up to our own efforts, it's not up to our own hands. You are a perfect defender, you are a refuge, you are our strength. Um, and you save us, God, you deliver us, and you protect us. So, Lord, after everything is said and done, we run to you and we dwell in you because when we are in you, we are safe. And Father, we ask that you would speak to us through, through a psalm as well. We pray this psalm in your name. Amen.